so on and so forth, there's not really food, but you have to make it look like food. He did all that, he read it all. That's Samantha Chin. Uh, you might have seen Samantha Chin is my friend Feldman's daughter. Uh, I don't, I don't her. Hey, here they come. Here you go. All we move just in time. So I, I'm, I'm interested in everybody. It's working out better than I thought. So Samantha Chin. Samantha Chin is Calvin, and Calvin is like the Calvin, Calvin and I met, so this is how we met. <laughs> we're in school, and we, we went to Dartmouth together, and we were in the same dorm. And, and um, I was a couple of years older. Yeah, he was a couple of years older. And he actually introduced the speaker who, who, who uh, talked about TM, where I went to the introductory lecture. He introduced the speaker, and, and they told him he was supposed to dress up, you know. So, so he had on, I mean, I remember very distinctly, you know, he had on blue jeans and he had on a blue, everybody who's old enough to remember the, the dress code of the late, uh, of the early 70s, late 60s, he had on a blue work shirt and uh, blue jeans and a flower tie and, and a black suit coat that he probably had gotten for band when he was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. school band there. That was his attempt to dress up. My hair was down there. here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Part in the middle, I had fully the hair and he was down there. Yeah. So we didn't talk there, but I did see him. And then um, several weeks later, uh, it was a, 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 one of the Dartmouth football games. And I wasn't going to spend $5 to go see a football game. No. I was on scholarship. So, so I was doing my work, and then I thought, oh, I need some exercise. I went outside, the whole campus was deserted, everybody was at the football game. So I took a frisbee and I just tossed it up, you know, and then it came back down, tossed it up, came back down. He happens to be in his room on the second floor in the door, and he sees this frisbee <laughs> going by, and he looks out the window and goes, he didn't say, how pathetic are you? He just said, do you need somebody to play frisbee with? That's, that's how we met. We went and played tennis instead. And we played the tennis courts were outside the football stadium. So every time we had a good shot, the entire audience <laughs> shouted really loudly. Right. So that's how we met. That's how we met. We met together. We spent a lot of time uh, teaching together. We, we ran the, the, uh, the, the TM organization at Dartmouth together. and then. We were in Switzerland, and then we went to Hong Kong together for a little while, and then on and off. Yeah. But at times, when, when we had, didn't talk for three or four months at a time, but not then. <laughs> uh, so, Samantha is, I, I knew her from the week before she was born. <laughs> so, they were in, uh, you were in Vegas at the time, and I came out to, to, for the birth, because I had been at the birth of the son, uh, of Jesse. There's Jesse, okay, that's the older one. Um, and so Samantha um, didn't come on time, and I had to get back to work. <laughs> and as I was flying away, she was born. <laughs> so, but, so I've known her almost since she was born. Um, Ken Jenning and his Betty. wife, Betty. And, and Ken knows Calvin better than he knows me, but we've been doing things for years together, back and forth as well. Um, he's another writer. Um, and a psychiatrist. A psychologist? Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. Yeah. Psychiatrist. It's Cayman. Yep. Uh, we should play What's My Line. Okay. No one will ever guess what Cayman did for a living. Cayman also 
knows Calvin better, but I've known him for many years as well. And came in, met Calvin on one of the courses over in, Switzerland, in, in Spain, right? Spain. Now, Kamen has spent his whole career as a ship captain. Right? Right. Right. Still do. All, 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 across, yeah, all across the, the, the world, you fix ships. That's what he does. So I didn't say what Sammy does. If you've seen some Lululemon ads, you probably have seen Sammy already. Um, and uh, she also has a website designing clothes and stuff like that. But she's, you, you, you just got uh, one for uh, North Face, right? The for North Face. And Jesse, if you've seen, there's, Jesse does a lot of ads too. And um, he's a voice actor and does a bunch of other things like that. So, you know, all the actors like Hepburn and everybody's up here on the wall. So, you can, so Jesse, if you saw it, it was, he had this great role in a Western. Uh, you know, like, it was a small Western, but he, he played this great character in this Western. And, and out of everybody that was in the thing, he was the one that was acting. <laughs> it, it was really, really very, very good. It was good. Everyone else was really good. I looked like I was acting. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and uh, when we moved into my grandmother's house, I was eight years old. I went up to the attic. I saw this neat collection of Bondana. There was 12 of them, I think. So years later, when I was starting to do some work on Mark Twain, I asked my mother, and where's the other 12 uh, editions of this? Uh, 12 copies. And she said, oh, the other uncles and aunts must have them. So the uncles and aunts were all canvassed. That took a long time. Um, and they, we got uh, another six books. So now I was up to 18 out of 24. And then I was going through Milwaukee Airport a lot when I lived in Madison in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, they have a really cool used bookstore for those of you who are from that area, it, right in the in the uh, airport. And uh, he, I, I, I went in there and they had exactly that edition and they had five of the six books. Which I needed. And they had, there were like eight books there, but five of the six that I needed, so I was missing one. And then years later, um, I wrote this uh, short story, Mark Twain's Visit to Heaven. Uh, and uh, I went to Hannibal, brought four or five of my little siblings and stuff like that. And we camped there. And <laughs> I, they had a reprint of the other book, but it was a new, a new reprint. And so I said, well, at least now I've got it finished. So I got that reprint. I said, now I've got the full collection. <laughs> Three years later, what, what was it in, up in Vermont did the oh, music come out? Up in Vermont <laughs> for a music, a music camp, and Earl was teaching there, and he went off to a, a little bookstore and stuff like that, and he found a, a, a copy of that thing, and then he, he showed it to me, and he said, he said, uh, I found one that matches your set. Is it the one that you need? And it was exactly the one that I needed. So I said, I said, in that case, can I trade you the reprint for the uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he took the reprint and left the original. <laughs> I think I want a pavement on top of that. Which is <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Harold and Tamara are here. Come on in. Russell. Okay, Russell. Hi. How are you doing? Good, Russell. So I'm going to see Harold. Tamara. So I, I'm going to get right to you. Russell, come on out here. So, so Joe, you remember Russell Castor? I think I do. Joe Pilar, you had both legal assistants at the right. same time. So Russell Castor was my legal assistant. He's the one in the book, um, the, the senior partner. You know, he, he has a role as a senior partner as well. He helped me go to the to the guy who was cheating everything. Uh, you, you remember, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we we wrote to the thing. We took we took uh, uh, a bodyguard with us. <laughs> and, and, and one other person, because uh, we uncovered a fraud that he was committing, a $50 million fraud, which made it into the New York Times. A $50 million fraud doesn't get in the New York Times anymore. <laughs> way, way too little money, right? So Russell helped me with that. I haven't seen you in 40 years, maybe, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. And Russell also went to law school and it has its own legal practice on Long Island, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so and right behind us, Harold and Tamara. So Harold and, and his wife, his wife helps Harold get fed because she's been very, very, very good at a whole bunch of things. And Harold is a business consultant that I met in San Francisco. And he had this plan one time after we, we got to know each other for several years. Um, and we, they were in London when we went to London. We saw Harold in London and so on. We, we, we were seeing each other on and off in unusual places. But Harold had this scheme at one point. He said, you know, George, you, you, you got all these books and your, your election convo will come and stuff like that. He said, we need to launch you, and, uh, and I think I can raise $2 million to launch you, and then we'll take 
Mm. He said, yeah, you know, you like as, as an investment banker, so you do it. And I said, I said, I don't know if that's going to work. And he said, well, no, no, let's see if we can make it launch. This was 15 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. So I went to the publishers that had told me that they really liked my stuff, but it was too hard to launch somebody like that. And, and uh, they, they, I said, well, now I have backers for $2 million to put behind the books. Will that help? And the person at that time who was kind of new in the, in the internet era, he said, well, we can't, that won't make any difference. But what you should do is take the $2 million and buy followers on YouTube and Facebook. This is, this is the new thing. And if you, if you can get a million followers on, on YouTube and Facebook, then you can take that to the editors and then they'll, they'll say, but what if they find out that I just bought these people? <laughs> that doesn't mean they're going to buy my books. <laughs> so, so we... We killed the whole idea, but, but it was very generous of you to even think about that. <laughs> oh, response. <laughs> Matt Frank, another person that I know, uh, and Kelvin knows even better from uh, teaching. Kelvin got around teaching up and down the East Coast as other places. So that's, that's the New York Minds to tell them about them. Well, Matt's uh, 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 an investor for other people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. financial advisor, yeah. former trader on Wall Street and now. Advisor than Philadelphia area, mm -hmm. Miami, join the link. I'll call them in for. All right, now they're going to have a test. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think the people who come later, they're not going to be able to get it on this. There's too many. So now you have you have all kinds of information of who to talk to. Reminds me of, of, of church, you know, the front row was empty. <laughs> I remember to the back. So, um, three score and ten years, you know. The Psalms think that my life is over, you know. That's, that's, supposed, to be, that's supposed to be the final thing. Of course, nowadays it's really the start of a second or a third act for most people. Um, but uh, the way I look at it is that, you know, my substantive life is done, and the rest is gravy. Now, that's a strange analogy to use for a vegetarian gravy. But, <laughs> but 
I was raised on meat and potatoes. I, I really ate a lot of gravy. It took care of, took care of me all for the rest of my life, those first 18 years, <laughs> as far as gravy is concerned. Um, and I know uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I really liked the Lord of the Rings, like I'm, I'm sure many of you did too. And uh, I got the idea that sometime in my life, I would have to throw a Bilbo Baggins kind of party. You know, where, where just throw a big party. <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know any Gandalfs. Kelvin's the only one who comes close. Uh, so no fireworks. It's indoors, too. Uh, but uh, I did think, so which birthday should I have that on? Well, one of the funny things about, you know, uh, I know family and everything, raised Catholic. So Lent is a big deal. And in Lent, for my mother anyway, she was very strict about that, uh, you really couldn't party during Lent. So my birthday is March 6th is tomorrow. It's like just a couple hours from now. It starts. And uh, well, I didn't get to have any birthday parties. Aww. Oh. <laughs> because it was in during Lent, yes. But one year, it started on March 7th. I, 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 think, I think I was, I was about 11 years old. So I got to have my birthday party on March 6th. And I had you know, 12 of my friends over. I was about 11 years old. So that's the, the party that I had. And, uh, and I thought, OK, so I have to have a big party sometime. What is it going to be? And I just forgot about it. But when I was in high school, I decided I read The Lord of the Rings. And I said, this is really cool. You could put it on. I'm going to have to actually go out and be a lawyer or something in order to pay for this. <laughs> so, so I had to plan ahead. And so I thought, it'll have to be at the end of my, my career and all that when I'm retired. But I realized that it probably wouldn't be good to wait until my 111th birthday. Like, like Bill Goldbeggin said, that probably would not be a very smart thing to do. So I, I settled on 70. So, so I, I've kind of had this in the back of my mind for a long time. <laughs> so 70 years. Really briefly, 24 in the Midwest, 16 on the East Coast, 24 on the West Coast, 6 abroad. That's my 70 years. So I got around, and, uh, and, and I remember lots of things. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so much fun to have done that kind of thing. And everywhere I went along, I picked up some friends that, that as, as somebody said here, none of them think inside the box. And, and I, I thought, well, that'd be a great part of the party, to bring together a whole bunch of people from different parts of my life. Um, so you're really from four different groups of, of, of friends. One is my family. Um, they I've known the longest, of course. And then uh, in my 20s, people from the TM organization when I taught TM. And then from my whole legal career. And then now I do all these author interviews at the Commonwealth Club. I've been doing that for 20 years. I know a lot of authors. And uh, so I invited a lot of East Coast authors here. Um, because those conversations are so good. And I thought, OK, so everybody's a conversationalist that I know. And just get everybody together. And we had that. Totally impromptu invitation. I mean, I, that wasn't planned. It worked out very nicely to invite uh, to introduce everybody as the circle kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, but so you have some idea about what the other people are, and there's all kinds of funny things. Uh, these two guys worked in Afghanistan at the same time, then you know, it, all all kinds of things like that that are going on here, which is exactly what the party was for. Um, so, as all of you know, or at least most of you know, not. At least half of you know, I should say. Uh, you know, I like philosophy. Uh, and I've done a lot in philosophy. And I am not going to bore you with too much philosophy. And I wasn't even going to talk about any of my ideas. Which, but I came up with an excuse to do that. So, so I'm going to. Um, because just on February 24th, I thought of a new supplementary argument, which I really liked. And I've never heard before. And I, I, it's really good. And I just can't not share it with you. So, and unfortunately, it takes about an hour to prepare you for that. No, no, no. no. I'll give you the, 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 the basic rundown. Part of my idea, I'll just, the highlights. So, one of my conclusions in my 20s, um, so, how much further back do I have to go? So, um, as I said, I, I, I taught TM and I, I worked for Mari Shimashiogi. We taught abroad. My friend Kelvin and I were in Hong Kong together. A lot of these other guys we met and not met, and so on and so forth. And while I was in Hong Kong, one, uh, the British Library there was excellent. Um, and I read everything they had by Mark Twain. And I also uh, was already a big fan of Plato. 
And so um, I read his stuff, and I was using Plato's ideas to try to clarify some of the stuff in Indian philosophy from 4,000 years earlier. This is a fun young way to spend your time, right? <laughs> Did, didn't all of you, you, know, I, you know, in this group, at least, some people can identify a little bit with that, right? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, and, and the interesting thing was that the Platonic ideas and the Vedic ideas hit up against each other in a way which broke both of them a little bit, in a way which I found very interesting because I thought, if I, if I separate out the broken pieces of ideas, maybe I can put something new puzzle together. So that's what I did uh, it, later on uh, in my uh, middle 20s. So my conclusion was that life is an eternal democracy. Not that it's an autocracy or that, that there's a, an oligarchy, or, but it's, it's a democracy that we all get to say our two cents worth, that there is you know, something, something substantial that we are all playing on. We have, a, we have a common playing field, and we're all putting our little you know, things, trying to rearrange it the way we want it to be. One of our big problems is that we think that the other minds out there are, are, are little objects, to, like Lego blocks, that we can rearrange to do it the way we want to, and you know, they never cooperate. Um, and so, so we haven't quite learned that. We've learned that a little bit. But that's, that's the basic idea. Now, what is that based on? The first idea that I had a, a, a set solid basis to make that on was I was trying to figure out what's time, what's eternity, what's change. Okay. The, the basic kind of thing you think about <laughs> on, on a daily basis. And I, and I had a job at a library um, and, and uh, was, was weeding their collection. And so I had plenty of time to think while I was doing the work. Um, so what I came up with when I was, I was 25 years old then was a, an idea that I thought was very clear. I said, our problem is we're trying to understand time, define time, get us a clear idea about that. When what really works is if you talk about the continuum of change. If you, say, if you switch concepts, if you switch concepts that you're trying to clarify, you sometimes do much better. Um, a good example is if you're trying to understand ice and water vapor and water, you know, if you're, if you're trying to say what do they have in common, you have to step back and get to H2O, you know, to, to a molecule of water, and then say how much internal motion there is in the clump of water creates water, water vapor, or ice. So, analogy. Um, so I thought, let's go to the continuum of change. And the, one of the, not the first thing I thought of, probably the thousandth thing I thought of, was that how could change precede change? How could change ever precede change? How could you have a thought that would then create change? Because the thought itself, oh, I'd like to have change instead of no change, that's a change. So how could you have the thought? So it doesn't seem, it didn't make sense to me that change could get, could get started without a change, and that doesn't make any sense. So I looked at it that way, and then I said, okay, so time, I won't tell you all the rest of, this, of the details, but time, to me, was just our arbitrary way of measuring this continuum of change. And, and that what was eternal would be, you know, most people, when they think about eternal, they think about, and, and everybody gives everybody a headache, uh, but uh, every time they think about eternal, they think about something that lasts forever. So it starts now, and it just keeps going on and 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 on. And you know, if you think about that clearly after a while, you realize that whatever that would be, if it was the same all the time, would get boring, right? So there's Aristotle's arguments, which I'm not going to review, but Aristotle's arguments about the first cause and everything, they sort of indicate towards that. Well, what I did was I turned those around and looked at them from a different point of view and said, you know what, it makes more sense, actually, that there is a continuum of change with no beginning and no end. And Modern science, at the same time, says that we have, you know, the mass energy is conserved. There is no creation of mass. There is no creation of energy. There's no destruction of it. It just keeps being reorganized. So I thought of an analogy for it, and, and that, that is like a Christmas snow globe. So you have a Christmas snow globe, and of course, there's no globe on real life, but there's a globe, and inside the globe are all the objects that exist. And then you move it, and it shakes it up. And, and it shakes it up, all those little parts all move against each other and do things and stuff like that. And then they all kind of settle back down again, 
and then you shake it again and it, it goes in. So it's, and there is never any one scene that's exactly the same as any other one. They're never, all the parts are never all lined up exactly the same as they were at any other time because there's just too many pieces. Now, if you think of the universe as that, and you say there is, there's decillions of atoms. Let's, let's, I, I borrowed the atomic theory from uh, Democritus and everything. And you know, there, there, it was just logic on their part. If there's a discrete world, there must be discrete parts. Okay. It sounds like I'm going to go on forever, but I won't. Uh, so the discrete parts, in order to have a discrete world, there must be discrete parts that are indestructible. So I thought that sounds a little bit like the con conservation of mass energy, right? and they're indestructible. But what could be indestructible? Certainly not what people are doing in science today, because you always keep pulling it apart and making it a little bit less. Um, and it seemed to me that what those indestructible parts are, are quadrillions of times smaller than where we're looking now. And yes, I know, if you can't measure it, you can't know it. That's a 20th century myth, in my opinion, in science. Uh, we, we know lots of things by logic, including they do. They, they, a lot of their conclusions are based on logic, based upon observation. Now, I'm all in favor of science and rationality. That's what I'm trying to do on the big issue. But in any case, so the end conclusion is that we are living in a continual present. There's a certain amount of objects, which are these indestructible atoms. And they follow this law of entropy, which is that it always goes down, you know, it always settles down. But somebody's always shaking it up. Somebody's always shaking it up. Now, who, what's the answer to that question? It's a big question, and we're, you know, we're all speculating on it. But some force has to do that, because otherwise it, there, would be, there would be heat death everywhere. It's, it's, been, it's been this way going towards entropy forever, uh, or at least for an extremely long period of time. And so the idea is that there's got to be an anti-entropic force. And the only thing we know which does that is individual minds. And I don't even mean human minds, ant minds. If you go out and you see an ant hill, you, you, you see all the grains like, you know, have come, having come out of the hill and stuff like that. You know that that is not a natural event. That's a mind rearranging reality for its own sake, for what it wants. And so we do that in slightly fancier things. We even have people paint pictures of actors. Uh, you know, and, 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 and have all this more elaborate stuff. But we're all here in the present. And so the question is, are we all in a democracy of being part of it? Are we part of that substance? Or is there only one anti-entropic force that makes all of us do what it wants to and that we really don't have free will? So it's, it's, it's one or the other. And I think that the logic leans towards the other thing. I think we'll be speculating about this for a long time. But that's where the logic runs to. Now, the biggest nut of that whole problem for us to take as individuals is the whole idea that everything just is, that nothing was created, nothing is destroyed, everything always is here, right now, and nothing is ever going to be created, nothing is ever going to be destroyed. We're going to reorganize the parts all the time, and all of us will be reorganizing them as much as we can. That's what's going on. And the argument that I thought of just on February 24th is, there is no evidence whatsoever that anything is ever created or destroyed. We, maybe science is wrong. Maybe we'll eventually come to another conclusion about it. But right now, we know that every single transformation that takes place takes place in scientifically measured, absolutely nothing is lost. Things just get rearranged. So if that's the way everything is, still to be seen, we'll never know because we're never going to be able to measure everything. That's, that's, that's pretty easy to guess. But as long as we, that's there, we have that as a possibility. So actually, the argument that we are uncreated and we just are and we live in the continual present is the thing that common sense should be telling us. And I was just thinking that's, that was my argument. Maybe in 100 years or something like that, people will just say, how did people ever think anything was created or destroyed? Now, we have our imaginations. Our imaginations are so visual that we, that we think about our childhood, for example. And we, you know, all the things I did with Eileen and with my uh, brother Bill and my sister Barbara and so on, and my nephew Michael, all in our family home, all those things happen at different times, different places. That house is still there. And you think in your visual imagination, I could go back to that time. And then I would be there. But there is nothing there in that time. All the atoms that made up that house, they're all either still in the house or they're doing something else. 
And according to scientific analysis, just like our body is every seven years, it's all new, uh, all different pieces. You know, uh, that was pro it's probably true for the houses too. So there is no substance in the past. There's no substance in the future. There's only substance in the current time, the present. So I thought, now that's a very interesting argument. Because if you could say, if you can get people to the idea that there's absolutely no evidence for our common assumption and, and pretty reasonable assumption that things get created and destroyed, but that rather things are always being reorganized, yeah, I, I know that that will make you know, the creator, the destroyer, and the, and, the, and, the reorgan and the maintainer a little bit uncomfortable with this argument. But, but that idea might make more common sense and might be more acceptable after a while. And I don't think, and, I, and then I think, if people get used to that for about a couple thousand years, then maybe we'll get some kind of nuance that will make it all a little bit clearer to us, because this is just going to always be a problem. But we have to, it's a problem we have to deal with. But, but my idea about what's eternal is not something that goes on forever, but something, I define it as anything that is not influenced by the continuum of change. So anything that's never influenced by the continuum of change is eternal. Now, that means it can't be a party. It can't be uh, an action. It can't be an emotion. It can't be anything that we experience like that. What it is is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's a pattern which will always be true no matter what's going on in the continuum of change. It'll always be that the diameter of a circle and, a, and the circumference of a circle always equals pi. That will also always be true. And um, those kind of patterns, can we find those patterns in our emotional lives? Well, I think we can. I, I've written about that. I'm not going to go into that, but I think you can say, where does happiness come from? What's the pattern in happiness? What's the pattern in our other emotions? Why do we desire what we do? And, and what are the qualities of, of those desires that make a difference? The, the irony of the work that I did was that actually virtue and happiness are very totally related. The amount of, of, of your, the quality of your emotional life is directly related to the quality of your desires. That's one of, one of my ideas. And, and it's, it, it's a, a fundamentally interesting idea, but I had to eliminate some other ideas, like obedience is considered a virtue. By eliminating obedience as a virtue and, and realizing that voluntary cooperation in a free will world of, of our minds, if they're free will, that's a, that's a virtue to voluntarily cooperate with other people. But just, just to obey somebody, what you do is you experience the, the desire that you do, you're experiencing it for a different reason than the person who's trying to talk you into it. So one of the conclusions that I came to is any explanation of life that has rewards and punishments in it has got to be wrong. Because anything that gives you a reward and punishment is trying to make you change your behavior to suit their ideas so that you are really more of a thing to them than another mind making their own decisions. Now, we won't go into that because that has a lot of implications. But in any case, that's the idea. That's the idea that, that's the basis of, of the work that I did. So now you're all here, and, and uh, I hope you had a good dinner. Um, it was a lot of fun. I, I just started introducing people when they arrived, and it turned into this big party out there so that everybody could meet each other. There's a lot of interesting people here. Almost everybody's open-minded. If, you know, if they tolerate me enough to come to my party, you know that they've got to be somewhat open-minded. <laughs> so, so you can count on that. It, it, it'll be very hard to be weirder than I am. Uh, so enjoy your conversations. The, the end of the party will be, we, we can stay here until 12.30 or so, and you can just talk to anybody that you want to. And you, I see that lots of people have already made other friends. And, and I, I, I felt like this was a nice reunion for everybody. Um, but as long as we're among friends, you know, I thought I'd be a little bit more honest. Now, a lot of you probably think I'm already way too honest. Uh, but, but I thought I'd be a little bit more honest uh, because I, I have something socially unacceptable that I've kept secret for a long time. Now, why do you keep secrets? You keep secrets because it's socially unacceptable to do certain things. <laughs> and so you just don't tell anybody. And there's all kinds of things that we don't do, but we don't, we're not honest with each other. Uh, obviously, that kind of communication. See, to me, we're all in this world together. Everybody's got their two cents. I think the persons that have had the biggest impact on humanity, I've had three cents, right? 
Maybe they've had three cents, everybody else gets two cents. Maybe there are a few people that only got one and a half cents to, me, to average this out. But that's the difference. We have, we have billions of minds, and they're all having their impact on the world. And for all the people that are so influential, I think you can say that almost all those thinkers have had their ideas adjusted more to suit the people who say that they believe in those ideas than, their original, than accepted their original ideas. So, so uh, if, if people think, oh, I'm very influential with my ideas because so many people say that they believe me, well, you know, one of my analogies for that is if you, took, uh, if you had a very big worldwide uh, ecumenical conference and you had all the different Christian sects and you had all the different Hindu sects and you had all the, everybody came and each of them put on a piece of paper as they walked into the hall, this is the theological detail about my belief that is different from everyone else's, and that's why I have my own sect. Well, if you did that, and everybody went in and put their, their thing in the, paper, in the hat, and then when the conference was over, they came out and they each took one out, and they were told, now that is your sect's new in, you know, theological difference that nobody else ex agrees with. And that's, that's what you have to tell your, your, your group. And they just take somebody else's. I think you'd probably find fewer than 5% of the people in that sect would realize any difference had just taken place. Because it's not theological or philosophical explanation that really gets people. It's the social community idea that gets everybody. So um, one of my secrets that some of you know about and don't is that I have a pretty good memory. Now, I have a pretty good memory about lots of different things. I was able to memorize legal documents. I was able to memorize all kinds of things. Um, I don't have a photographic memory or anything like that. But what I do is I have a memory about substantive issues, substantive ideas. And from the time that I've been about 20 years old, I've had uh, memories that go way back um, and, and that are ex examples of things that happened to me that made an impact on the way I thought about different things. And so I've been weighing this idea. Oh, should I? No. I thought, how am I going to advertise the fact that this? When I, when I wrote my books in my 20s and worked on Plato's theory and wrote my, the gospel according to Andrew and so on and so forth, um, I was trying to get a publisher for the ideas. And I thought, you know, well, I got a lot of pushback, not because they thought it was bad writing, but they said I was aiming at too intelligent an audience. <laughs> and I said, OK, well, I understand that. And so. So I said, well, one way to do this is to, to have an, a too intelligent audience show up for your party. <laughs> and then you can talk about it a little bit more. But of course, I've been talking about my ideas at the Commonwealth Club for 20 years now. And, and that makes me at least think it's not impossible to talk about things like this. This is a really interesting uh, set of ideas. And um, I want some evidence that there is long-lastingness to our lives. We live in the continual present the whole time, but how far back does our past start? Now, I think there's no, one of my arguments about death, now that I'm getting closer to it, uh, is you don't really need to be afraid of it for whatever is true about it. If you die and you're done, you know, which is what a lot of people think for good reason, um, because they see the creation and the destruction of the objects, and of course they think that we're, we're, that's who we are. Um, and, and yep, to a large extent, that is who we are. But if you die and you're just a body and you're not a mind, then you have nothing to worry about. You, you, you can't wake up the day after you die and say, I'm feeling lousy that I'm dead. <laughs> you, know? you have no emotions. You can't be upset. You can't cry. You can't do anything. You're not there. So, so what are you worried about from dying? Dying will be a relief if you've been sick. It's just, it's just not a problem. Now, if on the other hand, you die and you suddenly realize, hey, I'm still alive, even though, even though you didn't think that you were going to be there. You, know, you might have believed that you were going to die, and that was it, and you were planning on that, and you made sure all your money went to somebody else and didn't put it in a trust or try to get your body preserved so that you could, you know, all those kind of things. So, <laughs> You, you, were, you were accepting of reality. And so you said, OK, I'm going to die, and, I, and that's it. And then you die, and then you realize you're still there. Now, there have been a lot of people in the 20th century and the 21st century that have had near-death experiences. 
um, and because our modern medicine has improved so much, right? And so they have their experiences. And the funny thing about all of them is they almost always see beings of light and angels and so on and so forth. And, but they almost always have things that are part of their belief system. And then that confirms their belief system. And I'm, one of my other conclusions that isn't going to probably be that popular is that if there is more life, it's probably just as divided into groups as we are here, <laughs> thinking, thinking that this is the way to think about things. And, and you know, some of those near-death experiences where they say, oh, these angels came and they, tried to, they wanted me to come with them, but, I, but I, I eventually had to come back for some reason. They wanted me to come with them. And I, I think, you know, it's like walking down the streets of Los Angeles and having two guys from Scientology look at you and say, you know, you're not looking really happy right now. We have something for that. Come on in here. Come on in here. And of course, if they're, if they're looking nice and bright and light and everything, you're going to say, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Just take me. My favorite of all the NDs I've heard is that, you know, of course, it was somebody in Marin County in California, where else? Uh, <laughs> but the guy was a motorcyclist, and he, he got in a motorcycle crash, and he was in a coma for three months. And he had, he had been studying meditation with a Buddhist uh, guru, and uh, the Buddhist guru had passed away. And he said that during his NDE, he, he talked with his guru, and his guru said, you have more work to do. You have to take my ideas, and you have to spread them, and so on and so forth. And then he said that there was a sort of angelic being that talked to him and said, you know, you, it's time for you to come with me. We're going on to another world, and you're going to be really wonderful there, and this is what you should be doing. And the two of them ended up arguing over him for the three months that, that he was in a coma. And eventually, he came back, obviously. So the, the, Buddha, the Buddhist guru obviously won the conversation or something. But you know, that sounds much more like life to me. You know, if we do continue, just remember, all the people that you know and their personalities, that's what's going to be there when you get there. I know that's not, that's not like good news, you know. But that seems to me what's most likely, right? Where else are they going to come from? So, so, so how do we deal with that situation? So I, I, I do think that a lot of our explanations, decent as they are, are, have been scaring us silly about something we don't need to be afraid of. Um, yes, you know, you can say there are no rewards and punishments, but that doesn't mean that if you have a bad marital relationship and you get divorced that she's not going to be mad at you or he's not going to be mad at you. And he's not going to try to do something to punish you, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the universe doing it. That's your ex. No. <laughs> There's a, there's a difference. And I think that if we, if we accept life that way, we have a little bit easier way of saying how much control we have, how much we don't have. So, so among other things that I remember, I remember, and as I said, it, it, I've been testing this for almost 50 years now um, and, and seeing whether these memories hold up, whether I say, oh, that was nonsense, so on. I I've tried to test them, see what they say. I won't tell you very many of them because there are just way too many. But, but I thought that there's a literary argument to be made here about showing continuity. And, and so I'm writing a book uh, about those memories to show that continuity. Um, and one of the things that I remember is Socrates getting killed. Um, and I'm in a meeting with my fiance explaining to her, uh, we're, we're both in our late 20s, I don't know why it took me so long before I married her already. I, I, I don't have that memory. I'm sure I blocked that one. <laughs> but, but why I can't marry her because I have to leave. My family's telling me, you got to get out of here. You know, we're, we're, we're going to get in trouble if you stay because you're connected to that guy. So you got to get out of here. So I had to give up that relationship. And I, I kind of mourned it my whole life. And so I remember it. The interesting thing is, 2,300 years later, I wrote about that in a memory that I had at that time, but I wasn't 100% sure it was a memory. But I wrote exactly the same story that I remember now in a different way. And in, in addition to that one, I remember plenty of other things. I, one, one that I find very funny is that uh, at one time I was Greek, and I was going to, to Egypt. My mother was very good. She, she, she wanted to know something. And she couldn't, she couldn't learn anything, any secrets uh, of any of the special mystery religions and stuff like that. But she knew I could get in. So at 18, she sent me 
to study abroad and learn as much as I could and then come back and tell her everything that I learned. So uh, I went to Egypt and I was trying to get into the mystery religion of one of the Egyptian priest setups and the, the priests, well, they didn't want to take me. You know, I was a foreigner, first of all, so they were prejudiced against me and they wanted to, you know, keep it real secret. So after me being persistent, 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 and I'm sure that none of you ever knew that that was true about me. <laughs> but after being very persistent, they finally said, okay, we'll teach you, but only if you come to the temple entrance right here um, at midnight and stand there naked and then we'll take you in and initiate you. And I said, okay. So I stood there naked and they didn't open the doors. And they didn't open the doors. And it was now six o'clock in the morning and the sun was coming up and I'm standing there naked outside their temple. And you know, all the people started going to work, maybe to build pyramids, I don't know. <laughs> and, and as they went by, of course, they saw me standing there naked and they were laughing. So it didn't take too much laughter before the priest opened the door, grabbed me and pulled me in. Now, but I was Greek, you know. I, I had been running in, in, in uh, races uh, naked, which as they did. It didn't bother me in the slightest at that point. It wasn't socially unacceptable in Greece for me to stand naked there. It was socially unacceptable in Egypt. So it was like the easiest thing I did to get into something. Uh, it wasn't anywhere as hard as any of the other ones, uh, but it was only because of my cultural values. So it tells me something about cultural values, but it also, it also let me know that that was something that I could use to my advantage. The other irony that I do remember is that they really had no secrets of any use whatsoever. You know, they, 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 you know, I did learn a lot in Egypt, uh, but that group, they didn't, you know, it was useless. They thought they had all this really cool information. Totally useless. Uh, so I remember things like that. And I, I remember a lot of painful things that happened to me. I remember a lot of things that, that created idea strains in me. So anyway, I'm trying to write that. I'm trying to write it in the way I'm talking about it now to make it like our lives. Our lives are now. There's no difference between it. So just in case any of you are interested in giving me some advice about that, and I'm sure you are, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you my sample chapter. There are 20,000 words that I would uh, you know, send to a publisher. I'm thinking, should I get it published or should I not get it published? If anybody wants to review it in this group here, they can review it and then give me the idea, should I or shouldn't I? And I, I asked intentionally lots of people from totally different viewpoints on this so that I could get a nice, wide, diverse spread of, of ideas. OK, so now how many think I've been too honest? OK, so, so that's part of it. Now, one thing I wanted to say, because there's a lot of writers here, is an idea I have called team civilization. I think as writers, and, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm the prime you know, offender uh, on this. Uh, you know, the damned human race, you know, is like we, we want to reform them, but we don't want to reform them. We want them to conform to what we want them to be. Now, our imagination can always beat them. We've been developing our imaginations. You don't, you, it doesn't matter what you write. You, can, you, could, you could write for comic books or whatever. You've developed your imagination to write. And so that's something that can be done, right? So um, I think writers in seeing this and saying that we are all in this together, I think as a team we should say, it doesn't matter what your political ideas or your religious ideas or your other ideas, if you're in favor of kindness and getting along and voluntary cooperation and everything, you're on team civilization. Don't fight about it. You know? don't, don't argue about it. Uh, if we cooperated a little bit better, now it, I know that it's like going to a, an academic department and saying, well, I know all you guys like the same thing. You like the same literature. And you, you get in arguments over the littlest things. And, and so, yeah, that's what we are. That's what we are like. But I do think that we are successfully shifting human race very slowly in the way that we want. And I think we just need to be patient if we're going to do this a little bit more effectively. Because I think we've been very successful. From, that's also from my memories. You know, if you just look back at literacy and how recent literacy is and how big a change that has been for large numbers of people. And, and they don't have to be brilliant writers themselves to have literacy make a really great impact on their life. And we just say, you know, to me, 
You know, so I've rewritten the golden rule, among other things. <laughs> I, to be more generous to others than you would ever expect them to be to you. No, no equality, just be generous. And, and the idea of sharing freely is, you, when you share freely things, I mean, that's being generous, you, that means you give out what you want to and let everybody use it however they want to. However they want to, because that's the way life actually works. If they don't say that, they're lying to you. Right? They, they're always, everyone's always adjusting in their own minds exactly how they're reacting to what you're doing. So, um, and as a public speaker, you know, this is one of the things that, that I find hilarious is that uh, there's only one thing that people are more afraid of than death, and that's public speaking. <laughs> and I think it's because they don't like to have everybody judging them. But everybody is going to do that. That's, that's reality. Everyone is going to see what you're saying and know, look at what you're doing and put it in their own mind. And one of the nice universal things is everybody's got to figure out how it's much better to be me, I mean, to be, to be yourself, than to be the other person that you're paying attention to. There's always got to be a reason, because you are you. That's one thing that nobody else can be. That's, you are indispensable to yourself, right? And you're not indispensable to anybody else, really. You know? and, and that's kind of a hard thing to take when you feel so strongly how indispensable you are to yourself. <laughs> But it's actually true, you know, that, that is how indispensable we, how, but it's simple because instead of saying you want to be indispensable, to, I, I knew a lot of people at law firms who thought they were indispensable. <laughs> they're, they're all on their fifth law firm by now. Uh, so if you, if you say that you don't need to have that, all you need from that, from society, is all you have to do is be valuable to other people. You don't have to be indispensable, just valuable. And it's easy to be valuable to other people. All you have to do is give more than you take. You don't need to have to be, you know, like a lot more <laughs> if you don't want to be generous. Just a little more giving than taking. You're always welcome in any organization and anything, as long as you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so, so I'm not advising total honesty. Uh, that's not, that doesn't usually work. But that, that seems to me something that team civilization could do a lot better on by, by all the writers thinking you know, we're all on the same team. Yeah, I disagree with him, disagree with him. But instead of saying I disagree with him, you say, yeah, he's a quarterback, I'm a tight end. Tight ends are much more important than the quarterback. Yeah, he gets to throw it all the time, but, you know, and people focus on him, but this guy, I'm the guy who really makes the, the, the whole thing work. And everybody, everybody has a different place on the team based on what you're doing. And, and the other thing I think to think about is there's no such thing as perfection. So if you just say, um, I want to be the best weightlifter in the world. I can't also be the best long distance runner. You know, nobody is both of those things at the same time. So you pick and choose. And if you're smart, you pick what you love to do so that you enjoy it. And when you change your mind, you change your mind and you pick something else. If you've got all the time in the world, you really have a lot of time to change. You know? And if you don't, you won't know that you don't have a lot of time. To, you know, as I said, you're either there or you're not there. So, so either way, it's a good strategy. Either way, it's a good strategy. So now that I've done that mistake, you probably have to thinking, so yeah, it, she should have kept his mouth shut. Um, and that was a big mistake. But the bigger mistake, the bigger mistake that I made today was, you know, I brought this. And I brought the wrong ring. I thought I had the one ring, you know, Bilbo's one ring. It just turned out to be my high school class ring. That's not going to do me any good because right now I think, you know, maybe if I could slip this on and disappear, you know, that would probably be really good timing for me. And, uh, and you know, I, I'd love to head off into Rivendale, you know, and, and read the books with the elves. Uh, that seems like a really great way to spend the rest of my whatever is left. Um, but but instead, instead, I'm doing this. <laughs> um, so, so my book is going to be called Ancient Memories. And uh, as I said, anybody wants to do it, that's fine. And I, I know a few of you asked uh, earlier today, so why did you wear a tux? So I thought I'd explain that, that one thing, that one small thing. So I wore a tux because I'm here to serve. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm a waiter. And what I mean by a waiter is I have patience. I know exactly how long this is going to take. I've been working on it a long time. I've made little inroads here and there. And I know what I'm up to. 
And so I have patience that it's going to take me a long time to achieve what I want to with these ideas. Um, and, and I don't really have you know, really large hopes for it, but I think the people who think about ideas and everything, see, it's one of the great things about being a philosopher. There aren't a lot of big things about being a philosopher, but the one thing that's really good about being a philosopher, if you're really a philosopher and not just like a professor of it or something like that, where you kind of pretend that you like philosophy, but you really have the scientific attitude, then, then whatever idea is better that somebody else tells you, you love it. You love it when they tell you something new. It doesn't, it, if you're stuck in your own ideas, you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and so, so one of the things is, well, I'll test, I'm trying to try to get these into the stream of, of uh, these ideas into the stream of the cultural conversation. Uh, one way or the other, I, besides this party, uh, one of the things I thought of doing was going up the, the uh, Empire State Building with suction cups. But, <laughs> but I picked the safer route. Um, but if you, if you just look at it from that point of view and you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this, I'm going to lay this out here. Well, what's the end result going to be? The end result is going to be, especially among my kind of friends, they're going to say, I'm going to prove you, your ideas are, don't hold up. And I'm going to rip them apart. And I'm going to show where the logic goes on. It's all based on logic. It's not based on, on memories or anything like that. It's based on logic that's laid out. Um, uh, so it can be ripped apart. But if it gets ripped apart, then those people will give me new ideas to help me put together an even better thing. And if it, if it works and goes into the cultural conversation and says, oh, that's a useful way to look at it for a few people over on the side, then, then I, I, also, I also win. So I really, you know, I, I've set this up as a win-win proposition for myself. So, so don't worry about it. So, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. And uh, I'm sorry that I added that big chunk about philosophy in there. But I was so happy with this uncreated idea that it would actually be more common sense. And I, I know that that probably sounded absolutely ridiculous. But, but if you think about it, uh, I think it's going to hold up as an idea. Um, another idea I think is going to hold up no matter what is, is my explanation for evil, something people have been talking about for a long time. I take evil and I, I, I divide it down into, I, I get rid of some of the stuff that people call evil and I talk about cruelty. And I define cruelty as taking pleasure in other people's pain. And of course, who wants that? Now, one of the things I found fascinating in my 20s when I was thinking about cruelty was in all the religions and all the philosophies, nobody ever said cruelty was the main sin. It's not on the list of major sins. It's not on the list of, of, of mortal sins. It's not on the list of anything, cruelty. And cruelty is the thing that we can't stand the most, really, in life. And it's the hardest thing to have a civilization with cruelty. So I find it fascinating that cruelty has not there. And I think, you know, to, to bring J.K. Rowling into this to, to match Tolkien, um, she, she had Lord Voldemort, you know, get these death eaters to go out there. Why would anybody follow a guy like that? Why? Because he gives them permission to be cruel. He gives them permission to be cruel. And I think there is no religion that's been able to survive as a popular one without in some way giving permission to people to be cruel. Usually it's in a very subdued way. Sometimes it's just you get to go to heaven. Every once in a while, we'll let you look down at hell and see how those people are suffering and how much better your life is than theirs, and then you go back to heaven. And that, that is feeding their, their feelings of cruelty, that they're, they're taking pleasure in other people's pain. And that's a very popular idea. And so you have to have ideas that are going to be popular for lots and lots of people. And I didn't worry about that, and, and, and I didn't achieve it. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a set of abstract ideas instead. So anyway, that's what I was up to for 50 years. I, some of the lawyers might not have noticed. Uh, some of the other people might not have noticed. The family members that noticed and that I talked about it back when I was in my mid-20s didn't want to notice. <laughs> but in any case, I haven't been able to shake it. Uh, and so I thought I would write about it and, 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 uh, and try to explain it because I have a feeling that it has a chance of somewhat undercutting cruelty, somewhat undercutting several other ideas. But the, the other part of it about the cruelty is that if we're all individual minds in this world, this huge universe, it's certainly understandable why we would try to find our way. There's no blueprint, yet we've, we've talked about the blueprints. We've, we've, some people have said, I've got the blueprint and everything, but all the people who've said it, they all have different blueprints. So, so it's kind of hard to believe there's only one. Now, one of them might turn out to be true. Good, let's all analyze it and see if we can. But 
we're in this world all together, and we do think that there's some, some people just give up and say, it's all an illusion, and therefore, it doesn't have to make any sense. Everyone's intuition can just be what they want to. But we can't really help each other very much unless our intuitions about the world are discussed with each other about the objective reality we all share and see what we really can communicate to each other. And obviously, the more we lie, the harder that communication is. So and I, I, I have to say that I've been egging myself on for a long time. So, so one of the things that I want to do is, is test one of my theories uh, from the past, which is that the only way to destroy a humbug is to laugh at it. Fortunately for everyone, I don't have all that much time left. <laughs> So as I said, I, I brought all of you together from various different fields and stuff like that. And we have this place to enjoy. And you can see all those wonderful portraits of, of Catherine Hepburn and all the other stars that are all members of this club, uh, or were. Uh, maybe they still are. Who knows? <laughs> uh, and and uh, enjoy your conversations. Have a great time. And uh, thanks a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.